melody to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song, play skillfully with a shout of joy. For the word of the Lord is right, and all his work is done in truth. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea together as a heap. He lays up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen as his own inheritance. The Lord looks from heaven, he sees all the sons of men. From the place of his dwelling, he looks on all the inhabitants of the earth. He fashions their hearts individually. He considers all their works. No king is saved by the multitude of an, of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain hope of safety. Neither shall it deliver any by its great strength. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on, on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart shall rejoice in him, because we have trusted in his holy name. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in you. Amen. All glory be to our Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you very much. Well, again, a very good evening to all. I pray that you guys have had a wonderful week and a lovely weekend. We are coming towards the end of this weekend, and tomorrow is Monday, another start of the week, and I pray you guys are looking forward to Monday. I hope so. <laughs> those who are working, I pray you continue doing so. And those who are uh, going through some rough seas, I pray the Lord Jesus bring you out of them in no time. And those who are wondering, what shall I do next? May the Lord enlighten you and open the path with clarity and confidence to do his will always without hesitation. I'll ask our beloved, uh, the Good Shepherd uh, English Choir, to begin this evening with a hymn. Please, Eddie and Stella. Thank you. Sorry. Um, there was an event happening at uh, this place and um, different cultures and different musicians and different bands they were playing. So there was an Australian band, they just finished and they were coming off the stage. And the next one was an Assyrian band going up the stage to play whatever music they were playing. So this Assyrian keyboard player decided to hit a couple of notes uh, to make sure that it is all tuned and everything's fine. The Aussie keyboard player... He listened to the Assyrian guy uh, tuning his keyboard. He went up to him and he said, Excuse me, mate, I think your keyboard is, it's had its life, lifespan. It's finished. It's very, it sounds very, very weird. He said, No, brother, it is absolutely fine. That's what we call a coratone, which you have no idea what it means. So when he heard, ay, 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 he thought it was gone and finished. So I hope we are not, ay, 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 ay. I hope we are all tuned and going full steam ahead. All right. Well, thank you very much for making it this evening. For those who are new for the first time here, my apologies in advance. Um, to, to this evening's lecture is a continuation of the last two weeks. But I pray that you will um, gain some new information that you can implement in your Christian and spiritual life. Well, we are continuing, and it's going to be the last session of the last two weeks, and that is, lend me three loaves of bread 
which was which is from the gospel of saint luke chapter 11 verses 3 uh, verses 5 to 13 so it's from luke 11 verses 5 to 13 i'm not going to read these verses again we've read them for the last two weeks but a small intro to link this third and final session of this mini series of lectures um we said that Luke 11, 5 to 13 talks about three trilogies. Now, a trilogy is three, triple. So there are three trilogies which the Lord Jesus is giving in this particular ch- uh, chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. The first trilogy is the three loaves. Lend me three loaves. Then the second trilogy, the Lord says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek, you shall find, and knock, and it shall be opened to you. That's another trilogy. And then the other trilogy is, if a son asks his father for a bread, a piece of bread, will he give him a stone? If a son asks his dad for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead? And if he, and if the son asks his dad for an egg, will the father give him a scorpion instead? another trilogy. The first trilogy, three loaves of bread. Second trilogy, ask, seek, and knock. And the third trilogy, bread for stone, fish for uh, serpent, egg for scorpion. Three trilogies, and we said that each one, the first point in the first trilogy goes hand in hand with the first point in the second trilogy with the first point in the third trilogy. The first points in the first, second, and third trilogy deals with the spirit of the human being. The second point in each trilogy deals with the soul of the human being. And the third trilogy, the three points in the third trilogies deals with the body. We said the Holy Trinity comes to save this perfect human being that is made out of body, soul, and spirit, as St. Paul mentions in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, then the Lord God comes to save us spiritually with the soul and the body, all collectively as one perfect human being. Now, we said the spirit to be restored requires to be born again. So the spirit needs a new birth. The soul requires salvation. The body requires redemption. So the spirit requires a new birth. The soul requires salvation. The body requires redemption. We spoke about the spirit's birth, the soul salvation, and today we are going to touch base on the third point in the second trilogy, knock, and it shall be open to you. And then we will continue and finish the last trilogy, uh, bread, stone, fish, serpent, egg, scorpion. Now, we're going to come to the th- third point in the second trilogy, knock, and it will be open to you. Now, knock is to do with the body. The last point in each trilogy deals with the body, the redemption of the body. Now, for our body to change from a worldly body into a spiritual body, from a worldly person, materialistic, earthly person, to a spiritual, heavenly person, instead of going downtown clubbing, brother, I'm beginning to come to church every Sunday. My weekend is with the Lord, not with Habibi Sabufa in the backseat. How do I change from an earthly body to a spiritual body? Now, it requires two knocks. Since it's knock and it shall be open to you, yes? So it requires two knocks. The Lord Jesus, since he is God, he knows what your body needs in order to change. The first knock, we find it in Luke chapter 24, verse 45. This is about the Lord. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. Who did this? Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He opened their understanding, meaning he opened their mind. The second knock is in the book of Acts, 
chapter 16 verse 14 the Lord opened her heart whose heart Lydia Lydia was a female at the time of Saint Paul she welcomed Saint Paul into his into her household and she was converted and received baptism with her entire family and became Christians on the hands of Saint Paul and he opened he meaning the Lord Jesus and he opened her heart so what are the two knocks for the change of your body opening your mind and opening your heart both of them are the acts of Jesus Christ he opens your mind and he opens your heart these are the two knocks that are needed in order for your body to begin witnessing change if the mind opens to the Word of God and if the heart opens to the accepting of the Word of God then I will liken the body onto a TV screen if the mind opens to the Word of God and if the heart opens to the acceptance of the Word of God the body is likened onto a TV screen now what do I mean by a TV screen you see there are no such thing as holy bodies and unholy bodies every body B O D Y your body is the same there is no body better than the other body they are all equally the same they're equally the same but what makes one body different to the other is that TV screen let's assume for a moment a church has a TV channel and on their TV channel they put some bad music and wrong things and the club has a TV channel and in that club TV channel they put the Holy Mass service you cannot come and say how come the church TV is showing wrong things and how come the club TV is showing the right things it has got nothing to do with the TV itself it's got to do with the information you feed that TV screen your body and our body is like that TV screen the body poor thing can only function with what you've given it as far as information are concerned so if you're feeding your body good information the body will behave accordingly and if you're feeding your body bad and wrong information the body will uh, will work and act accordingly it's the information that we bring into the mind and bring into the heart Habibi. now what changes the body is the information information put in your mind and heart will reflect on your body see what you think of what you feel deep down is what you're gonna act and do and behave isn't it very true in Philippians the epistle of st. Paul to the Philippians chapter 2 verse 5 he says let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus Jesus Christ he was perfect and still is and will always be perfect God and perfect man this perfect man has the same thing as we have as human being except one thing he never knew sin he never thought of sin he never did sin for one simple reason he is the only one out of the entire human race to ever come to this globe to this realm that was born of a woman only Jesus has heavenly father not earthly there is no where heard in the history of mankind someone born of a woman without an earthly dad only Jesus did it 
And this, he was born without the original sin. But as far as a human being, like us, human body, human soul, human spirit, thinks, feels, you hit him, he gets hurt. You say a nice word, he feels happy. You say a nasty word, he doesn't like it. He cries if he's not sleeping enough, he's tired, he needs to eat, and he feels what we feel exactly. Let this mind be in you as it was also in Christ Jesus. Very important. I'm going to touch base on this a little shorter uh, of a while. What is the difference between hearing and listening? Hearing in a simple English terminology is you hear a word, it goes through one ear out the other. That is hearing. Did you hear my son what I said to you? Yes, mom. I heard it, but it didn't say. Formula One, man, Grand Prix, doing 320 Ks down the freeway. So it goes from one word to the other, from one, one ear to the other. Listening, the word goes at the same time through both ears. <laughs> the word goes at the same time through both ears. So when the word goes through both ears at the same time, the, it meets here in the middle, it, it clashes here, or has, has a crash, and then goes down to the heart. Listening through one ear out the other, a hearing, sorry, through one ear out the other, listening goes through both ears, hits in the middle, and then goes down to the heart. In Luke chapter 2, verse 19, but Mary, Mary our sweetheart, the queen of heaven, the virgin of all virgins, the love of my life, the, the, the eyesight, the crown of my glory, my mom, and the one and only. I love her to death. I can't live without her. I cannot. I cannot. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. In Luke 2.19. But Mary kept all these things and pondered him them in her heart. Wow. What a beautiful person she was and is and will always be. But while she was on earth, she thought of everything she heard from the angels, from God himself, from people. Whatever she heard, she thought of them in her own heart. She was very good at the language of the heart. Amazing. When the mind grows, it yields false glory. When the mind alone grows, it yields false glory, self-pride, a show-off. When the heart grows, it yields fruit. The heart yields fruit. The mind yields self-exaltation, false glory. As one of us receives the mind of Christ and hides that mind in his and or her heart, the body will begin to illuminate. Romans, the epistle of St. Paul to the Romans, chapter 12, verse 2. Look at this. By the way, St. Paul is amazing. We will do every now and then topics about the epistle of St. Paul. Absolutely powerful. Depth of theology. One of the greatest theologians the world will ever, would ever see is St. Paul of Tarsus. Romans 12.2 And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. St. Paul is saying to all of us, do not be conformed to this world. Meaning, don't be like the guy who is living downtown. Don't be like, what's up, bro? You want to go out? Yes, let's go and have fun. Let's go clubbing. Let's go dancing. Let's go and have tequila. Let's have scotch on the rock. Let's grab a, a room in the Novotel Hotel and overseeing the harbor. And we're going to spend the night until early morning. And mom is calling 24-7. I'm ignoring her phone call because mom, 
Just get a life, go where you came from, somewhere in north of Iraq or Lebanon or Syria. Leave me alone, mom. This is Australia. It is Sydney. Oh. That was Japanese. I don't know what it means, but I thought just I'll throw that one in. So you're having fun. You're having fun. That's the world. He said, don't be conformed to the world. Don't be like the world. But, so if I don't be like the world, what shall I do, St. Paul? He said, be transformed. Transformation, change. Okay, how do I change? He said, renew your mind. Wow. Renew your mind. I did a topic about this a while back ago. I'll just touch base on it a little bit and a bit sort of update on it. There is one thing in life you cannot kill that is called idea. An idea cannot be killed. The only time you can get rid of an idea is when you are able to replace it with another idea. But to kill the idea that has been haunting you for so many years, you're wasting your breath, your life, your energy, you will never succeed. You can only replace it to get rid of it. You see, when an idea matures and ripes, becomes a thought. When the thought matures and ripes, becomes a word. When the word matures and becomes ripe, becomes an ideology. When an ideology matures, becomes a philosophy. When a philosophy matures, becomes a lifestyle. In simple English, what you thought of, what you became in the future. This chair you're sitting on was an idea in someone's head. That idea turned into a thought, into a word, into an ideology, into a philosophy, into a lifestyle. The chair was made. Everything came with an idea. St. Paul says, all of you received ideas in life. And when you followed those ideas, eventually they became what you are now, your lifestyle. You want to change from a worldly being into a spiritual being? Replace that idea with another idea. There is only one idea that will stand forever, which is the truth, the word, and the only word of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. This is the only idea I encourage all of us to put in our minds. When you read the Holy Bible, you are receiving the mind of Christ. The word of God changes the way you think. And the moment it changes the way you think, guess what? It's going to change the way you behave. See, behavior comes from what you think of. I don't want to dwell on this too much. I need to go back to my information again. Here we go. There you go. When we were going through the three trilogies, um, or in the second trilogy, which is Ask, Seek, and Knock. Well, we, we discovered last time when we were talking about Ask, we found Elijah and Elisha. When we were talking about Seek and You Shall Find, we found Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And in this one, the third one, which is Knock, and it shall be open to you, it is talking, as we said, about the body. What changes the behavior of you is the mind and the heart. And I'll add this as well. Somebody put it this way. He said, um, the shortest distance to bridge yet the most difficult of all is the distance between the mind and the heart. It is so difficult to bridge between the mind and the heart. You know why? Because the mind speaks logic and the heart speaks 
feelings and emotions. Two different things cannot come together. The mind says one thing, the heart says another. And to bridge it, to bridge the distance between the mind and the heart, it is the shortest, yet the most difficult of all to do so. What comes between the mind and the heart is what we find in the Gospel of St. John, the last chapter 21. When the Lord Jesus had risen from the dead, in chapter 21, the Lord Jesus, after rising from the dead, he reveals himself the third time to his disciples who had already lost hope. So it was there, and the Bible says it this way, beautifully put, and there at the Sea of Tiberia was Simon Peter, two, Thomas, three, Bartholomew, or Nathanael, Bartholomew, not Nathanael, Bartholomew. And then two of the Lord's disciples and other disciples, Simon Peter, Thomas, Bartholomew, or Nathanael. Simon Peter represents the mind. Bartholomew, or Nathanael, represents the heart. Thomas represents suspicion. See how the Bible talks? You see, so Thomas said, I will not believe that Jesus is risen until I see him with my eyes and touch him with my hands. Because the other disciples said, we saw him, he is risen. He said, no, unless I see, I'm not going to believe. The Lord revealed himself in that upper room again while Thomas was there. He said, Thomas, come here, touch me. The spirit has no bone and flesh like I do. I don't want you to be unbeliever, but I want you to have faith in me, Thomas. Don't ever be suspicious of your Lord. When suspicion comes in our life, destroys the bridge that tries to unite the mind to the heart. The Lord made promises. We are doubting those promises now because we're going through some rough seas. Where is Jesus? Did he say, I'm not going to leave you ever? Well, I'm fallen. I'm gone. I'm destroyed. I've been crying out to him. He's not coming. Where is he? You know what? Forget it. He's forgotten about me. No, never. You see this old man? I'm still standing here. I've been through hell and back. Literally. I'm still standing. You don't want Satan. Trust me. You don't want him. He's very vicious. And he's real, by the way. And he can rip anyone apart if it wasn't for this great man called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He would rip us apart. He's very strong. But when Jesus comes, he's not even a little mouse. He runs away. Yeah. Outside of Jesus, don't say, I can make it. He will swallow you before you blink your eyes. He's too smart for you, too powerful for you. He's too ancient for you. You're very young. He is, he is, he's got a lot of history behind him. He was there in heaven. There was nothing made on earth. He was there in heaven. So you can't, you can't outsmart Satan. He is too knowledgeable for you, my dear friend. He knows the Bible from cover to cover by heart. He doesn't have a heart, but doesn't matter. He memorized the Bible word for word, verse for verse. He knows it all. He can fight with you. He, he tempted the Lord Jesus with the Bible. He put Jesus to the test using the Bible, quoting biblical references. See? So you can't outsmart this guy. Only Jesus can. We need the Lord in our life. Now we'll come to the third trilogy. And for the next 9.9 .9 hours remaining. Come on, love guys. <laughs> for the next 10 hours. Okay, I'll cut it short. All right, for the next 10 hours, I'll be talking about the last trilogy, which is if the son asks his dad for a, for a, a bread Lebanese bread, might the best ba'albak habibi, you know, the best bread. If, if the son asked his dad for a, a bread, would he give him a stone? If the son asked his dad for a fish, will he give him a serpent? If he asked for an egg, will he give him a scorpion? 
There is no connection. What bread, what stone, what fish, what serpent, what egg, what scorpion? Nothing to do with it. But it's got deep meanings. Now, if a son asks his dad for a bread, will he give him a stone? This is relating to the spirit. You know, we said the first point in the first trilogy, love of bread. First point in the second trilogy, ask. First point in the third trilogy, if a son asks his dad for a bread, will he give him a stone? All these three talk about the spirit. Why? Because the bread symbolizes life. The Lord Jesus in the Gospel of John chapter 6, he says, I am the living bread who descended from heaven. He who eats me shall live in me forever. Bread represents life. Now, if bread represents life, then what does a stone represent? Death. So if a son asks his dad for bread, life, would the dad give his son a stone? Death. Of course not. Then the Lord comes back and says, Then how much more your heavenly Father gives the Holy Spirit to those who seek Him. If you parents who are sinners are showing mercy to your children, how much more your Holy of Holies, our Father who art in heaven, how much more will He show mercy to His children when they ask of Him? Now, In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 3, Satan put Jesus to the trial. He said, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to be bread. Ach, cheeky little bugger. Satan, very cheeky. He said, if you are the son of God, change this stone into bread. The Lord Jesus replied and said, it is not by bread only A man shall live, but by every word that is uttered from the mouth of God. If the Lord Jesus, if the Lord Jesus had listened to Satan and changed that stone into bread, which he could have done very easily, by the way, then when he saved us on the cross, he would have done it Satan way not his way. Jesus said, indirectly, to Satan, that I came specifically to change the stone into bread. I came to change people who are like a stone dead into a living bread. I came to do that, but I'm not going to listen to you, Satan, because you are a deceiver. You are a deceiver. Another time, Satan spoke through the mouths of the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jewish priests. When was the second time the Lord Jesus was entering Jerusalem sitting on that mule? We call it Palm Sunday. When the Lord entered Jerusalem, everybody was shouting and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Even little babes were crying out to the Lord Jesus. Satan ate hot Indian red pepper. Very hot chili brother all the way from Calcutta. (laughs) He ate hot pepper. He went wild. He became jealous. How come even little babies are praising this man? I can't get to him. So he spoke through the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests. And they went to Jesus, these priests and the Pharisees. They said, tell these children to shut up. The Lord said, if I say to these babies to shut up, the stones will cry out. Wow. He was saying to Satan, haven't you not heard what I said before, Satan? Haven't you not heard what I said before? I thank you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent, smart, intelligent, and have revealed them to babes. I thank you, Father, that if you have hidden all this treasure from so-called wise people and educated people, and I thank you for revealing them to little bambinos. 
My wealth is given to anyone that says, I am like a baby. Please, Lord, teach me. Don't come to the Lord as a show off. Don't come to the Lord and say, I can do this for you. We cannot do nothing for the Lord unless he helps us. Don't be a show off. Say, I'm a little baby. Lord, use me as you wish. Without you, I'm dead. Without you, I'm blind. Without you, I'm ignorant. Without you, I'm weak. Without you, I'm nothing. You're everything, Lord. Therefore, the first loaf meets in the, in the first point of the second trilogy, ask. And in the first point of the third trilogy, bread into stone. That deals with the birth of the spirit. When the spirit is born again, we become members in the body of Christ spiritually. We become members in the temple of Christ. And born again is not our topic. I've done a lecture about baptism. But born again, my beloveds, with all love and respect, I'm not judging, I'm not saying anything, but, but the truth has to be told and said. Born again is the sacrament of baptism. Baptism is born again. Not a born again movement. No. Born again is when you're baptized. Not when you call Jesus and say, now I want to make you Lord and Savior over my life. I want to make you King over my life. When you are mature and adult, and then you call Jesus willingly and call him to be King and Lord of your life, then you're born again. That is non-biblical. That is called what St. Paul refers to as the renewal of relationship. And renewing your relationship with the Lord must be done every single moment of your life, every day you you call him but when it comes to birth you cannot be born every day you're only born once isn't it <laughs> born again is a spiritual baptism one of the seven sacraments of the church now second love meets seek and then and the, and, and the second point of the second trilogy is seek, and you shall find the second point in the third trilogy, if a son asks his dad for a fish, will his dad give him a serpent? The fish symbolizes blessing. Serpent symbolizes condemnation. And we see the word condemnation first time ever mentioned in the Holy Bible when it when the Lord God came to the serpent. He said, serpent, you're condemned. On your belly shall crawl, creepy crawl, and you shall eat the dust of the earth. On your belly you shall crawl. You are condemned. The Lord God for the first time ever condemns something called a serpent. So if the son asks his dad for a fish blessing, will the father give him condemnation, serpent? Of course not. Um, now why is the fish why the fish symbolizes blessing. And the Greek word, and I have to watch myself here. We have some Greek people here, and I love these Greek people. They're wonderful people. And in the, in the Greek, um, in the Greek language, um, the word fish is made out of four letters, four Greek letters. Each letter represents a name of the Lord. Each letter represents a name of the Lord. It is made out of four letters, the word fish in Greek. It is um, Isos, Christos, Ios, Alethos. Isos, Jesus. Christos, Christ. Ios, Son, Alethos, God. Jesus Christ, Son of God. That's the word of fish in Greek. The early Christians, up until the first half of the second century, their symbol of Christianity was a fish. The second half of the second century, 
the cross became the symbol of Christianity. Now, it is okay to have a fish on your car, one of those stickers, but do not replace it with a cross. Don't ever do that. The early Christians, they only knew this. So they took the fish as a symbol, sign of their Christian faith. But when we read in the Holy Bible, what does St. Paul talk in relation to Christ? He said, I will only boast about Jesus Christ being crucified. He did not say anything about the fish. He says also the cross is the power of God. He did not say the fish is the power of God. Or I will boast about the fish because the fish represents the Lord Jesus. No, he said the cross. Where was Jesus crucified on the cross? What is our glory? The cross. Why does the church put the cross right on the top? In every church you go to, you see the cross right of the top, uh, the, the, the rooftop. Why? Because that is the crown of the church, the head of the church. It is the crown of glory. The church, meaning the Christians, the baptized souls, they say what is, what is uh, ridiculed by the world, which is the cross. To me, the church is the crown of my glory. I'll make it the crown over my head. Because with the cross, Jesus showed his love for me. The groom to the bride revealed his love when he shed his blood on the cross to save you and me and the whole world. This is our glory. So therefore, my beloveds, the fish symbolically represents blessing, which is the name of Jesus Christ, Son of of God but the cross was literally done Jesus literally died on the cross not symbolically literally died and Mark now the fish represents blessing we said the serpent represent condemnation and the gospel of Saint Mark chapter 16 verse 18 the Lord Jesus is saying this they, meaning the apostles, the 12 apostles, and, and the other apostles as well. They will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will take up serpents. Have we ever heard in any of the biographies of the saints, St. Peter, St. Saint, Saint Matthew, St. John, St. James, carrying serpents on their shoulders? No. But what is the Lord saying? They will carry serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. Serpent here um, is, represents me. Egocentric me, selfish me, that's the serpent. They will carry serpents, meaning they will carry their own egos and put them under the feet of Christ. I am the most powerful enemy to me. I am much more stronger of an enemy to myself than Satan to me. And this is one of the reasons why Jesus Christ did not get rid of Satan. You see, if the Lord had got rid of Satan, he had to get rid of me and you before Satan. Because I am an enemy to my own self, worse than Satan to me. Worse than Satan. We have three enemies. People around us, Satan, and moi. The danger is with me is because I'm an enemy to myself from inside, within. Satan is my enemy from without, from outside. People are my enemy from outside. And anything that is from outside, do not be afraid of. What you should be afraid of when the enemy is inside of you, not outside of you. <laughs> 
You see, I can run away from an outside enemy. I cannot run away from the enemy within because wherever I go, I'm carrying that enemy with me. I'm carrying that enemy with me, my beloved. So, St. Peter, he wrote two epistles. The first epistle, he begins with the following words. I, Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus Christ. And the first epistle. The second epistle. I, Simon, I, Simon, the servant of Jesus Christ. And the first one, Simon Peter, the disciple of Jesus Christ. The second one, I, Simon, the servant of Jesus Christ. Why are you saying that? Simon Peter. He said the first epistle deals with all the challenges that comes to oneself externally. The second epistle of mine deals with all the challenges that comes to one's self internally. So when the, when I face the external challenges, I am the disciple of Jesus Christ. And I'm not only Simon, I am Peter as well. Simon the weak, Peter the strong, and I'm the apostle of Jesus. But when it comes facing the internal challenges, moi, me, 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 my own weaknesses, all I can say, Lord, have mercy on me. I am Simon the weak. I am not your apostle. I'm your servant. Please guide me, protect me, grab my hand and lead my way. When I face my own self, I'm afraid. My own self is a snake, poison. My own egos, they poison my life. All the problems in the world is because of moi. Superpower countries go into small countries, destroy the people and the lifestyle of that country. Why? Because they want to prove one thing. Guys, I am the most powerful nation. You better not talk to me again. I rule. I tell you what to do. It's about me. Otherwise, why do we fight? At home, why do we fight? Because I want it my way. Children with parents, brothers with brothers and sisters, husband and wife, at work, in the church, why is the church divided? It's because of me. This is my throne. And anybody challenges my throne, I will get rid of them. We fight because of me. The day you deny yourself, you don't have a problem. But it's the most difficult thing for anyone else to do. It's a challenge. Why are you going out? Because I feel like it. Don't go out. None of your business. It's my way or the highway, bro. I want to dance with somebody. Yeah, yeah. I want to feel the heat with somebody. What heat, baby? They're going to barbecue you later on. That's the kind of a heat you're going to get, brother. You think going downtown is fun? I'll catch you after one year. You'll be gone with the wind. Yeah, yeah. You're going to be history before you know it. Whoa. <laughs> when you do it your way, you're asking for trouble. We need to get rid of that serpent. My ego. Myself. St. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 9.27, he says, But I... St. Paul, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjugation. I discipline my body and bring it into subjugation. Meaning, I do not give my body what it wants, how it wants it, when it wants it. No. My friend called me and said, what are you doing? I said, nothing. And I'm still waiting for someone to come and define for me what does nothing mean. I'm still to figure this word out. Nothing? Is there such a thing as nothing? I don't think so, bro. So when you're saying nothing, what do you think, bro? We go in downtown. You come in. Before you hang up, you are with your friend. Superman is not as fast as the way you change and... <sighs> And then Marmari calls you, says, come to church. Oh, 
Marmari, you have no idea. I have the worst migraine ever. Oh, I was going to come. I promise. I made a plan. I was going to come last minute. Something came up, stopped me from coming. Next week, good luck, brother. I won't see you next week. Um, I bring the body into subjugation. I discipline it. Not, not hurt the body, but discipline the body. There's a difference. So next time when your friend calls you, Hey bro, what's up? Nothing. <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. You want to come downtown? No, sorry bro, I'm not coming. What do you mean? What happened to you? Are you crazy? No bro, I just woke up to myself. I'm going to see the best looking bishop in the world, man. <laughs> He's single and available. He's hot, you're not. And we're going to cruise with the Lord, baby. And the wave is going to be bigger than Hawaii. And there ain't going to be the great white shark coming because Jesus has put a net to protect moi from every shark attack. He is my lifeguard. He guards me all the time. So next time, say to your body, you're not going anywhere. You're coming to church. You know what? When you're listening to Eminem, uh, actually, <laughs> always poor guy, poor guy, Eminem, he cops it from really left, right, and center. One day, I didn't know. One day, they, some young people came to me and said, Bishop, do you like Eminem? I said, yeah, they're great chocolate. I liked Eminem. They said, no, 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 he's a black American rap singer. I said, oh, great stuff. He's white? Is he? <laughs> I've just tanned him black. Okay. So he's a rap singer anyway, but white American. Sorry, I'll take that back. He's white chocolate. Okay. So, <laughs> so we're going to see Eminem. Man, if the ticket is a hundred bucks, I'm willing to pay a thousand in the black market just to get in into Sydney Stadium. And if I'm coming to the church, it's for free. Sorry, I don't have the time. It's funny, isn't it? It's kind of weird. We pay mega bucks to go and listen to some, with all love and respect, nonsense. Nonsense. Okay, you listen to Assyrian music. I don't want to sort of, you know, they think I'm just picking on American singers. No, Assyrian singers or any music. I'm a Syrian, so I'm going to talk about Assyrian music. Okay, you're going to listen to this music, right? It talks about boy and a girl and love and all this. When you listen to it, sometimes it's very depressing, man. Very depressing. <laughs> and other, other times, they picture girls, they put this picture in your head that all guys are perfect, like they are Romeo. He's going to come sitting on a black Italian stallion, <laughs> the horse, and he's going to come and he's going to roll the red carpet and he's going to ask for your hand with the beautiful red rose in a cylinder and a big teddy bear with a big heart in the middle. And he's going to come and say, honey, sit on the horse back and follow your hero. We're going, but I'm not going to tell you where because I'm going to surprise you. And he ends up taking her to Fairfield, Nita City. <laughs> was a cheap going out anyway but this is all fairy tale actually i was mentioning this morning in the holy mass you listen to this music you are the moon of my life you are the star in the night of my life what is this man get a life and get in the daylight man you are the sun s-u-n jesus christ the son of the world the light of the world what moon, what light, what darkness? We need to hear the real word, the truth that changes a person. Put the word of God in your mind. Let it come down to your heart and let it grow. It shall bear fruits. But these fruits are going to be divine. Then your body will illuminate like the sun. If you ask for an egg, will your dad give you a scorpion? Great dad, isn't he? <laughs> He's a scorpion for you. Ouch! <laughs> 
The third point in the first trilogy is a loaf. The third point in the second trilogy, knock, and it shall be given, it shall be opened unto you. The third point in the third trilogy, if you ask for an egg, will your dad give you a, a scorpion? It talks about the body. The egg symbolizes resurrection. The shell is the tomb, and inside the shell is the little bambino. There is life inside the egg. You see, when you look at, when you look at the tomb of the Lord Jesus from outside, it's a place where death lies. But inside the tomb, Jesus was always living. When you look at an egg, there is no sign of life. Why? Because the sign of life is movement. How do you know this is living when there is movement in there? So movement is the sign to life. When you look at the egg externally, there is no sign of movement. Therefore, it is dead. But inside, there is a life. Just because externally there is no, no movement, it doesn't mean inside it's dead. There is a life inside. So the egg represents or resurrection. Once the shell splits open, the little tew, tew, tew comes out. A living being comes out of that dead egg. And when the tomb of the Lord cracked open, the Messiah came out, the living Messiah forever. So the, sh the egg represents resurrection. Therefore, the egg represents life. Resurrection, I was dead and now I'm risen, I am alive. So egg represents life. Scorpion, my beloved, if you don't know this about a scorpion, the scorpion itself is blind, cannot see. That's why the scorpion, when it hits anything in its, pa in its path, straight away sends that poison from the tail. Since it cannot see, anything it touches becomes afraid and attacks to protect itself from the enemy. So if it hits a rock, throws poison. If it hits a piece of wood, throws poison. If it hits a human being, throws poison. So in other words, the scorpion's path is all poisonous. The egg represents life. The scorpion's path is all poisonous. Therefore, serpent represents the authority of Satan. Scorpion represents the thoughts of Satan. The thoughts of Satan are all poison. Just like the scorpion. Anything it hits, Gives poison, throws poison, throws poison. It's a poisonous path. The thoughts of Satan are all poisonous. You follow the, so the thoughts of Satan, you'll end up poisoned and poison will kill you. A poisonous thought is the scorpion. Egg is resurrection. Coming out of that poison is the egg. Resurrection. Come out of your poisonous lifestyle. Come out of your old habits lifestyle. Come out of your old dark paths. Come out of there. Rise. Let Jesus shine on you. Stop following in the footprints of the scorpion. You are following the thoughts of Satan. They are nothing but poison. You come out of one ditch, you fall into a greater one. You will never be able to come out for as long as you stay in the scorpion's path. Come out. Let Jesus rise you from the dead and give you life eternal abundantly. The Gospel of Luke chapter 10 verse 19. Behold, the Lord is saying, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus says, I give you authority to trample on serpents, the authority of Satan, serpents, and on scorpions, the thoughts of Satan. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, has given us the authority to overcome the authority of Satan, serpent, and the thoughts of Satan, scorpion. But how do I 
do that. Well, since scorpion represents the thoughts of Satan, egg represents Christ's thoughts. Satan has thoughts, and Jesus Christ has his own thoughts. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, But we have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ revokes the mind of Satan. How do I get the mind of Christ, the thought of Christ? Guys, I invite you eagerly, and I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, I beg you, make the Holy Bible your friend. Read the Holy Bible every day. Let the thought of Christ enter your head, your mind, and let that thought come into your heart. You will get rid of every evil thought that is poisonous like a scorpion in your life. And you will see a change happening externally, outwardly in your body. The body will start behaving differently. You know, I could preach for days on end unless we hear the word and implement it in our life, we're not going to see a difference. You can say, oh, the lecture was nice, but if I don't take something out of this lecture and put it into use in my own life, I will not see a change in my life. I must start to changing the way I live. And the way to begin it, start reading the Word of God. If you haven't read the Bible before, start tonight. And do it every night. Do it every day. If you have the chance in the morning, do it. If you have the chance at lunchtime, do it. If you have the chance in the evening, do it. If you have the chance before you go to sleep, do it. Because you're receiving the thought of Christ, pure, holy. The world will only give you poison. Yeah, just over an hour. It's not bad. The world only gives you poison. Guys, it's very sad. People go to school, go to college, go to university, study very hard and become great doctors, great philosophers, great professors in the scientific field and so many different fields. But it's so sad after studying so hard and becoming so excellent in that particular field and end up saying, there is no God. I can never fathom this. I can never comprehend it. How can you say there is no God? What kind of an ignorance is this? And I'm saying it with humility. I'm not judging. But I just want to really grasp it. You're telling me that a, something exploded over 14 billion years ago and all this intelligent universe came into existence? All this complex being and beings and this complex universe came into this perfect, perfect existence because there was a big bang? Are you serious? Seriously. Man. Unbelievable. You ask a scientist, do you believe in energy that it exists? He said, of course I believe. Can you ever see energy? He'll say, no. So you can't see energy? No. And you believe it does exist? Yes, of course. Why and how? Because there are proofs that energy exists. Oh. So why are you coming and saying there is no God? Just because I don't see God? In the flesh, you're saying he doesn't exist. You just told me you, don't, you can't see the energy, but you believe in energy. Well, I can't see God. 
and the spirit, but I believe he exists. You know why? Because there are too many proofs that he exists. Too many proofs. Um, one day I was talking about this. I'm not a scientist, but one physicist said there was an explosion. Fine, fair enough. Anything is possible with God. Who caused the explosion? The scientists don't have an answer to it. <laughs> Nobody was there 14 billion years ago. <laughs> so anyway, this physicist said, when the explosion happened, there was an enormous force and energy and heat coming out of this explosion. When a bomb goes off, there's a lot of heat and energy coming out of it. So there was an enormous explosion happening. And out of that enormous explosion, enormous heat came out of it. He said, we will take only one formula out of millions of formulas. The formula of expansion and contraction. The formula of expansion and contraction. He said, when the explosion happened, because of the enormity of the heat, things, tangible things, exposed to high level of heat, they expand. And it took maybe millions of years for that heat to be to cool off. And as the heat began to cool off, those objects became they began to contract in coldness. So in heat it expanded, in heat it contracted. He said, we'll take one formula. The speed determined how fast should the object expand and how slow should the object contract. Who controlled the speed? He said, it was so perfect, so perfect, so perfect, the speed of expansion and contraction. He put it this way. He said it was like um, the speed of light at a nanosecond crossing the strand of hair. So if any change in the speed of nanosecond, the speed of light crossing the strand of hair, if it had been slightly faster or slower, no life would have existed on the face of this planet. Speed of light travels at 300,000 kilometers a second. Speed of light travels at 300 thousand kilometers a second. A nanosecond is a minute of a minute of a minute of a second. So you could imagine the speed crossing what? A strand of hair. You can't even capture it. He said it was that accurate. The speed of expansion and contraction for life to have been made possible. You're telling me there is no God? <laughs> Man, I feel sorry for people as such. But when you search for this God, you need to find the right one and the only one. I put my life on the line for this God called Jesus Christ of Nazareth. He is the only one. There is no other God but Him. No other God but Him. You will never see any other God in the next life. You will never find and discover any other God in this life. Nor in the next. He is the only one. He is the only one. Six foot one. Long brown crispy hair split from the middle all the way to the shoulders. Tan skin, long face. Greenish eyes. He was 33 years old, 2020 years ago. And he's still kicking, baby. After 2020 years later, he's still 33, single and available, baby. Good looking for a Jew. I love this man. I adore this man. I worship this man. 
He is my life. He is my honey. He is my sweetness. He is my way. He is the only truth. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last. He is the morning star. He is the sun of righteousness and healings in its wings. He is the S-O-N of God and he is S the S-U-N of the world. He is the, the life and the resurrection. He is the good shepherd. He is the I am that I am. And I'll leave you with this. You know, when Moses asked God, what's your name? What shall I tell your nation at the foot of the mountain? He said, go and tell them I am that I am. Yahweh, Jehovah, is I am that I am. In the Gospel of John, Jesus Christ, he refers to himself as the I am. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the life and the resurrection. I am the good shepherd. I am the living bread that descended from heaven. I am, I am Jehovah. Guys, get it. You know what he meant when he said to Moses, go and tell them I am that I am. You see, I am meaning I am everything and everything is I am. He was literally saying to Moses, when you see the bird, it is I am. I am that bird because I created that bird. I am that bird. When you see the plant, I am. When you see the water, I am. When you see the land, I am. When you see the stars, I am. When you see the heavens, I am. When you see the galaxies, I am. When you see the human being, I am. I am the creator. Everything is I am. And I am everything. This is Jesus of Nazareth. All glory to his holy name. Amen. Are we ready for another uh, beautiful hymn? Before you go to sleep on me. Lean on me, for you're not that strong. Oh my guys, Eddie and Stella, let us hear your angelic voices once again while we contemplate on these beautiful lyrics being sang to all of us. And... Um, let us take this moment, my beloveds, and contemplate on it. If you'd like to bow your heads, you want to close your eyes, you want to sit in absolute silence and just focus on this moment while Eddie...